Pacific. Also, we'll be watching the pennant chase, the biggie in Los Angeles with the Braves and Dodgers. ESPN will show you that one and keep you up to date as well on the Blue Jays and A's. The Red Sox will be hosting the Yankees. And we'll see you after baseball on Friday. I'm Mike Tarico. Up close is next. I'm Chris Myers. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Up next, the not-so-cowardly lion speaks out and pokes fun at pro football and the media with actor and writer Alex Karras up close. It was this punch that more or less uh, introduced Alex Karras to the show business world, but an unforgettable role in Mel Brooks' Blazing Saddles was nothing compared to the real-life eccentricities and out-and-out -out outrageousness of Alex Karras, the athlete, and the person. In the first place, Alex Karras, football player, was good enough to be in the Hall of Fame. But after admitting he bet on his own team on national television and having a year's suspension by Pete Rosell in 1963, well, those hopes of being enshrined pretty much fizzled. What didn't fade were Alex Karras's hopes in show business. He got a taste of it first as a pro wrestler, then after good reviews in films like Paper Line and here with his wife Susan Clark in the Babe Zaharia story, Alex Karras was more than just the ex-jock. He was a personality, a performer in demand. After a stint with Monday Night Football, Alex started of the long-running TV series Webster, which is still seen in syndication. But Alex Karras, ex-athlete, actor, producer, has a little tongue-in-cheek gift to the football community. It is his latest book, his third, called Tuesday Night Football. It's a satirical and some might say not-so-fictional account of what goes on behind the scenes at a big-time TV network with a prime-time football game. Today, Alex Karras, Tuesday Night Football, up close. And now joining us, uh, my former neighbor, by the way, on Nichols Canyon here in Los Angeles, my good friend Alex Karras. Yeah, good to you see you. made some money and you left the neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sell it to you, though, thank no, you very no. much. All right, I want to get, first of all, these names. The Tuesday Night Football is a total farce. It's a, it's a put-on, a satire of uh, another fabled television football show. Uh, but these names are great. Lance Allgood. Some say it reminds them of a guy named uh, Gifford Lance Allgood. Well, there's no question. You know, I was, I was, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to be involved with what I thought was the most spectacular of all athletic events, Monday Night Football in the 70s. I don't right. think so much of it now in the 80s and the 90s. But in the 70s, it was the happening. And I got in the booth with Frank and Howard, and I thought Howard was as good a play-by-play -play announcer as I've ever seen and heard. And I thought Howard was, as far as I was concerned, there was Ed Sullivan and a couple other people I remember, and certainly Howard Cosell. So I, I was blessed because uh, as a writer and as an actor, as you well know, you have to take from characters you know. So I took what I liked about the characters, and then I went off into my own bizarreness. Um, Hence uh, the names uh, Lance Allgood, who was a womanizer. And, uh, mm -hmm. and this, this is the way you phrased it. A handsome airhead with an insatiable appetite to satisfy the female fans. Is and, that, and that close to the truth? And they adored him. They mm -hmm. adored him. Now, whether it was Frank that, that was that way, I don't, I don't really know. I don't know Frank that well. But I, again, it's my point of view, and it's my fantasy. And if I was Frank, I sure would have been like that. <laughs> Haywood Grueler. Haywood Grueler. It sounds very similar to a man we, we, we know, the man that you call the man everybody loves to hate. Let's listen to Don Olmeyer, your former executive uh, in charge of production for ABC's Monday Night Football, talking about the parallel to Haywood Grueler, an individual named Howard Cosell. I will always love Howard. And I, and I don't use that word uh, lightly. I mean, Howard was very good to me uh, as I came up in the business. I learned an awful lot. I think, uh, you know, Rune, Jeff Foy, and Howard Cosell were the three most uh, focusing people uh, in, in my career. Mm -hmm. And I, I also can understand how Howard drives other people crazy because there were times on Monday Night Football when 
when he drove me crazy. Uh, uh, but he did so much to change the face of the business in terms of allowing sports broadcasters the freedom uh, to not be homers if they didn't want to mm -hmm. and, and, and to report on issues. Mm, no doubt about that. He really blazed the trails. You have one great Howard story, though, that you remember. It had to do with a game in San Francisco and the wind was blowing. The wind, the, yeah, it was one of those deals where we were doing a pregame show and we, were, we had just a certain amount of time to do it and it had to get on the air quick. And, and Howard was having trouble with his toupee and he kept screaming to the assistant producer to get some glue, get some glue. Get me some glue! And constantly, and it was ready, we were about ready to go, we had about 15 seconds left, and finally the young man came running in with aspirin, and he said, glue, not aspirin, and the guy said, oh, I need it. <laughs> and, I'd and ran out of there. <laughs> yeah, he, but he, he, I guess a lot of people working around Howard needed some aspirin, the fact is he was an unforgettable figure, and you make no apologies, you love him dearly. I love him dearly, I, uh, I always think of him as a kind of a father figure for me, uh, when I, when I first met Howard, it was in 1957, and I was going to Europe uh, with an American team in the Balkan Games. I, was, I threw the shot put that time, and mm -hmm. I had just won the Outland Award, and it was his first radio coast-to-coast -coast show, and we had a long, long radio show together. And so I knew him before he was the character, caricature of himself, which is, you know, uh, Howard Cosell. So we go back so far together that everything that he says, even if it's something, you know, salty against me, I only look in his eyes and we kind of both smile, so we know where we're coming from. When he leaves the scene completely, what will we be missing? Well, you know, I don't think anyone can forget Howard Cosell. I know I will never forget him. He's kind of like my mentor, and, and uh, when you... You see, I watch the games occasionally still, and, 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 I, and I like the sport of football and everything, but I think he, he added a, an awful lot of entertainment to it, which it really was. And I, before that, I don't think people wanted to really call it entertainment. Interesting that you brought that up. I want to talk about a guy who wrote the book, Paper Lion, George Plimpton, and his contention that in your day, it was a lot more fun, a lot more entertainment than it is now. Here's Plimpton recounting the era, the Detroit era, when he wrote Paper Lion. Oddly, my greatest impression of it is, is, was the humor, was the how important humor, uh, particularly in, in people like Alex Karras and so forth, who were the team at that time, how important that was to the, the society. It was a sort of a hedge against the drudgery of, of practice and of seeing endless films and so forth. I think people don't realize how, uh, what, what, that, that, that is a very important ingredient of, of the institution of these teams. In a word, fun. And it was fun because you guys didn't make a million six. You made nine grand one year. You had to have a second job. Yeah, and the pressure was on us to get an off-season job, especially had a uh, family to support. And uh, we would come in, if practice was at 9 o'clock in the morning, and I came in at 9.30, and they would say, where were you? I'd say, listen, I need to get a job, and I had to go for an interview. Please forgive me, but I really need the money during the off-season. <laughs> Can you, you know? imagine doing that today? <laughs> uh, we've got a piece of vintage NFL films, but you're going to laugh at this stuff, because this is circa about 1964. I just love the language of the way John Facenda depicted Alex Karras, the noble warrior. Great voice. Oh, I love it. Let's look at this and listen, and we'll, we'll recount the way it was and the way they depicted Alex Karras. Defensive tackle Alex Karras has the ability to sift through a cordon of blockers and ferret out the quarterback. Rookie sealer quarterback Ron Smith bears the brunt of Alex's savage assault. Bart Starr of the Packers has often been the victim of Karras' powerful rush. Yes, we should make note that that wasn't John Facenda, but it was in that Facenda era. Savage Assault. Savage Assault. Yes, that was, that was, that's the way you were. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is, to me, that was the NFL's golden era, in my opinion. Then you move into the late 60s and early 70s when it became such a business that they called a timeout one day, and you didn't know who called the timeout. Well, that's when I knew television was going to play a big part in uh, football for the rest of the time. It, it, it almost, to me, is like a studio game now. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember it was the first Monday night game that the Lions were on, and uh, I, had, I was the defensive captain at the time, and we were... We were in a situation where we were doing really good and we were finally holding this team and we thought maybe they wouldn't score. And we had our 
the adrenaline was pumping and, and the referee called timeout and I said, who the hell called timeout? And he said, uh, I said, did they call timeout? I said, well, I didn't call timeout. Well, who called timeout? He said, Goodyear Tires. <laughs> <laughs> Did went, you hate oh, that? Okay. Did you hate that? I loved it. Why? Well, because I said to myself, well, if that's the case, here comes the money. <laughs> America at God work. God bless America. <laughs> All right, we're going to come back as Alex blows his nose here for the first time ever on our show. We'll come back and we'll talk more with the, the paper line, not so paper line, Alex Karras. Tuesday Night Football is the name of the book after this. Up Close is brought to you by Rockport All-Terrain Vehicles for your feet. say this with your discount subscription to this Roden track at the lowest rate going an instant TV discount of 997 off the basic rate if you grab the bargain now call toll free 1-800-544-1000 12 issues are just 997 an instant TV discount of half off the basic subscription rate to save now call 1-800-544-1000 that's 1-800-544-1000 doing drugs is like being on top of the world, everyone says so. Everyone seems to be having one dandy old time. Hey, it's part of growing up. Or is it? Just think about this. Before you go and do something you've never done before, you just better know what you're jumping into. Impossible to watch all the NFL action on Sundays, right? Wrong. See every key play in just 60 minutes of fast-paced excitement. ESPN NFL Primetime is all the football you need this Sunday at 7 Eastern. Recently had a chance to glance at the autobiography of Alex Karras. Um, I think it's even Big Boys Cry. Right? Even Big Guys right? Cry. Big Guys Cry uh, with Herb Gluck. And I re remember reading a chapter where you were seduced by your high school teacher, Miss Potts. It was the best thing ever happened to me. <laughs> you were seduced as a, as a, in your second year in high school? Yeah. And you said, and this is what you said in the book, you made love every day. Yeah. So it was the best thing ever happened to me. <laughs> she changed you know, your I life? Used to, I used to stutter a lot. And, <laughs> and, um, no, that's the truth. And, uh, and the reason, I guess, is because I was so big at such an age that yeah. everyone thought I was 12 when I was 5. Mm. So I always had a problem because of my f being so big, and uh, I never had the proper clothes because I always looked silly in clothes, much like Laszlo, the character in Two. Laszlo Horvath, yeah. the accordionist, the lounge player from the Holiday Inn. Exactly. Right. And and so uh, what happened was that I was uh, I had very low self-esteem at that time. My, my dad had just passed away and everything, and we, our, our 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 family was totally disarray. So we. And so what happened to me was this wonderful English uh, teacher that came over, she was a transfer teacher from England, and I guess she was lonesome, you know. Uh, Miss Potts. Miss Potts. And um, I liked her too, you know. Um, and so what happened was I used to do, I used to stay after and erase the boards for her, take care of everything she needed to do. And we had we had an affair, and I stopped stuttering, <laughs> and I felt good about yeah, myself hey. for the first time in my life. We have two quotes that I'm going to show. I want, can we take the second quote, folks, in the booth? Because this is this tells you a little bit about your self-image, this and and what you had to say about the macho image, coming from Greek, Irish, Scottish, Midwestern stock. 
A man's role was very defined. When you were 21, you got married, you had kids, you worked hard, and you saved money till you were 65. You were a man by God, and you were strong. You never showed your feelings. You never changed. If you lived through long enough, you retired to Florida, sat in a deck chair, and breathed oxygen out of a bottle. But n life, Alex Karras wrote, life is not like that. I finally admitted I was resisting change, growth. I realized I never was that macho cretin that football cast me as. So I stopped playing the role. That's really, I think, when you became a man. Absolutely. That was when I, when I was fired from the Lions and went on my whole idea of what I was going to do now the rest of my life. You know, use the word fire. You don't say cut. You don't say no, wave. I was fi you I were not fired. fired from the Lions. Absolutely. They didn't like me and I didn't like them. And I still don't like their organization. Mm. Pete Rosell, you said when he suspended you in 1963, I'll never forget you for this, Pete. I'll never forget you. Because, but you admitted you, you bet on your team. What was he supposed to do, Alex? You know, it's very interesting because I'm someday probably going to write about that, about that year of suspension and the, and the reasons why I would write about it is that I think I was framed hmm. along with Paul Hornung, and I think there was much more going on at that time than anyone suspects. We've talked about this before. The Carol Rosenblum that. you thought was involved in at, at some point on a maybe a small or a large scale a gambling ring. I don't think Carol Rosenblum drowned in the sea by himself. He was a good swimmer and I know Carol he's physically fit. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to those, that story yet and uh, I, I don't know whether or not I want to tell my version of it because I may get killed. <laughs> <laughs> But someday, maybe. How about Arch Leister? Should he be reinstated? He's bet not on his own team. He's bet other sports and says maybe more or less blacklisted, wants reinstatement. I think he needs to get a lawyer that knows what, what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he should be able to get back. If, if Paul and I get back in the league for what we did, which was betting, uh, and Pete Rose, in his own way, uh, served his time, certainly Sleister has already done his job. And I think he needs a lawyer. It, and God knows we have lawyers out there, don't we? <laughs> Quick thoughts, George Wilson, you, you talk about getting framed, you thought your former coach was getting the shaft from assistant coaches who wanted to do him in. You went to bat for him, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, I was very unhappy with the, with the fact that they let uh, George go, and there were a couple assistant uh, uh, coaches that really badmouthed him, and I, and I disliked that very much. He was a loyal, wonderful father figure, and the team, although we weren't great ball players we played 100 percent for george and i was very upset when that happened and i told the front office that so brett musburger you almost put him through a wall when he was a cub reporter well you know those were the days where i was really wild and and uh, when i lost a ball game i didn't like to lose i i dislike losing and uh, so uh, he asked me some very stupid questions how old was he one of them he was a young reporter with Ch in chicago at that mm -hmm. time and he asked me this silly question did you like losing today or some silly thing like that <laughs> in which I, I blew my stack and picked him up and threw him out of the locker room and uh, I'm very sorry that I did that to you but don't ask questions <laughs> what's it like to beat Bronco Nagurski your high, your high school childhood hero really uh, it, that's a great story because when I I used to have a, his autograph Bronco Nagurski autograph and it was in a little portrait and he had a had a wonderful flower tie on big long one and cut to years later when I was a uh, uh, wrestling in college, professional, under a different name and with a mask over my right. head. Uh, he and I were going to be on the same tag. I didn't know it. He said, oh, by the way, Bronco, Neg you're wrestling Bronco Nagurski tonight. Wow. And I flipped right out. Because you adored this I guy. loved him. And I went into the locker room and saw Bronco in person, and he had the same tie on that he was <laughs> in his picture 20 years before. Great flowery tie. He liked the tie. He, I uh, they say that he has his confirmation money. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's one of those kind of characters. Yeah. Alex Karras, the name of the book is Tuesday Night Football. More fun after this. Up close guests stay at the Beverly Pavilion, an intimate European-style hotel located in the heart of Beverly Hills Shopping and Business District. Two blocks east of famous Rodeo Drive on Wilshire Boulevard, it's the Beverly Pavilion. Inventing is not for everyone, but if you have an invention or an idea for a new product, it's time to do something about it. Call the National Idea Center at 1-800-235-8000 and you'll receive free confidential forms. The National Idea Center will assist you through all phases of new product development. Inventing isn't easy, but if you have a bright idea, call right now and you'll receive free information. That's 1-800-235-8000.
Are you a sports fan? Cash in on your sports knowledge and win $100 instantly by playing the Sports Trivia Hotline. It's fun. It's easy. Call 1-900-990-8888 from any touchstone phone and text your home. Be a winner and call 1-900-990-8888. That's 1-900-990-8888. Win $100 instantly. Coins are prohibited. $2 per minute. You must be a to play. Not sponsored or endorsed by ESPN. Let's go, boys. Gym time. The Tigers try to prove they're the kings of the jungle as Stan White leads Auburn against Texas. Part of a Saturday doubleheader. It's a jungle out there. It's Live on ESPN. Talking to Alex Karras, uh, reminiscing, and we're talking about the book Tuesday Night Football, which will be made into a movie. They're going to shoot it in Los Angeles starting in January, February. Um, I want you to listen to uh, Fred Dreyer, a guy that I know you admire a lot. Reminds me a lot, by the way, of you uh, in a different era, perhaps. Talking about football then and now, what's changed compared to the way it used to be. Here's Freddie Dreyer. Well, they've got exactly what they want. They've got uh, a freak show. And they've got a lot of, lot of, a lot of serious problems that won't show themselves for another five or ten years. It's like when they, when the owners, because uh, of bad weather, they lost a championship game, decided to go to Hawaii and have a couple of cocktails and change the rules and, and put a dome stadium in and then put AstroTurf in, and then uh, now they're going to uh, change the uh, rules by moving the hash marks in closer so everybody has a fair chance at scoring. They've got a lot of scoring now, uh, and. Uh, uh, they, they don't realize that the pass blocking rules to open the offense up had a whiplash effect that you wouldn't see for 10, 12, 15 years. You're starting to see it now. What has happened is you've, you've told people because of the way the rules are structured that you must be bigger in size. Mm -hmm. Guys like myself playing it, I played soaking wet uh, 225 pounds and uh, a defensive end you couldn't you can't play safety at 225 now mm. basically he's saying it's bigger but it ain't better no I, I agree with Freddie that's good observation I think yeah. yeah do you do you look at football much anymore and say to yourself boy oh, we used to be this or you don't look at it much at all period do you I don't spend much time with football I like it sometimes on Monday night because I'm home and there's really nothing but Sundays and Saturdays man I'm burned out yeah how many times can I see a quarterback get the ball drop back and throw it to the halfback for three yards around right in <laughs> I, I sound like Howard just for a second <laughs> how many times do we have to see it we know the audibles I we have a quote then this 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 reflects Alex this is circa about 15 years ago quarterbacks and tight ends die comfortably in big beds and when the Irish setter is whimpering on the other side of the door and someone is mowing the great lawn outside the big mansion ah but the linemen give it up in these little rooms in the poor sections the linemen never really are appreciated but they always seem to have the wit and the insight you and Fred you gotta have humor to play what we do yeah uh, when you when you all look back at this this game then what will you say was your greatest legacy Alex Karras I can't think of any. <laughs> it got me. It got me to where I wanted to go, which was acting. I, I, I all my life I wanted to be an actor, and because of circumstances, uh, I got, I played athletics first. Laughs, I guess, is what it got you most. Of it it kept me uh, right. Exactly. I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with the guys. The guys had a lot of good friends, uh, camaraderie, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And it stays the same. And I got a gift today. A gift certificate, too. This, so. You know, this is one of the very few shows that I've ever gotten a <laughs> gift on. And I love gifts. I know you do. <laughs> you got a video player and a CD player. That's recently, right, so just he's, recently. He's happy he's getting Because I'm selling books now. <laughs> I'm, I'm a different person. <laughs> he's a book salesman. He's an author, producer. He's a writer, and he's an actor. He's Alex Karras. Good seeing you again. Tuesday night football. Best of luck. Thanks, Roy. Michael Haynes joins us. We'll talk about the, this weekend's big games after travel range through Continental, offering grand destination vacations throughout the world, each with a double your money back guarantee. Continental Airlines, for a great summer vacation. Some people think he's a Superman, but when a 44-year-old has to throw 75 fastballs, even Nolan Ryan's muscles can ache. So after the game, it's the medicine doctors recommend most for sprains and strains, Advil. For me, it's a couple of Advil, and those muscle aches are long gone. And Advil's gentler on my stomach than aspirin. Today, it isn't aspirin or Tylenol acetaminophen. It's Advil. I feel ready to go another nine innings. 
Advil, tablets and caplets, advanced medicine for pain. Football analysts on our show, Michael Haynes now joining us. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, before we get into the games, the commercial implications, the impact that commercial television has on the game itself. You're on the field, and you've seen it quite literally change the game because they want to get more commercials in, right? Well, no question. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the networks or the uh, advertisers are paying more money, and they're trying to get their commercials in. And uh, I remember my rookie year, just like I heard Alex was talking a little bit earlier about, you know, we'd, the other team would be moving the ball. Time's out, you know, we get a chance now to get our breath and all this other stuff. But um, once they change the rules where they definitely want to get more touchdowns in and more action and m more uh, commercial time. So no more bump and run like we knew it. Anyway. No more bump and run. You know, we want those receivers to get open, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, which makes it really tough for a, a defender. But yeah, I guess it makes it great entertainment uh, for the fans. Did you resent it as a professional? Be honest. Yeah, I did. I mean, you grew up thinking of football, and I didn't think of it as entertainment. I thought of it as a game, it was played you know, with force, and, and the winner was going to win, you know. Uh, but when they changed it to entertainment, then you had the dancing in the end zones. Uh, you know, you had all these other type of things because people knew that they were going to be on TV and it was going to be uh, another uh, avenue for them to make it uh, into the inter entertainment world. Mm. Big games coming up this weekend. Let's start with Washington and Cincinnati. You think the Skins are a real powerhouse. They could put the Bengals 0 and 4 they win. They played very well last week. I really thought that once Bobby Beathard left uh, Washington when he, you know, going to uh, San Diego, that there was going to be a, a big layoff in Washington. But those guys, I don't know how they do it. They've come back year in and year out. And this year, it looks like they finally put it all together on both sides of the ball. You know, their special teams have always been great. You think they're the best team in football. Walsh, Bill Walsh on Monday told us he thought it was Buffalo. Well, Buffalo probably is. But those guys, they, I think they're so confident right now that they, they think that they're the best team in football, that they don't always play like it. Everyone's getting up for them every week because they're, you know, the, everyone knows that they're the best team in football, that you have teams like uh, Tampa Bay or, or the Jets or teams like that that have an opportunity to, to really knock them off because when those guys go down to, uh, to Tampa or go down to New York, they may not be up for the game. Mm -hmm. And Talk about you, the Bills now. Right, of course, mm -hmm. the Bills. You know that uh, anything can happen on any given Sunday. What happens if Kelly gets knocked out? Or what just what happens if the team is uh, sleeping and they don't really wake up in the fourth quarter? Last mm -hmm. week, they were able to do that and come with a big play in the last few minutes to win the game. Before we get out of here, the Rams and the 49ers. It's a crossroads game this week, and the Rams did not play well against New Orleans. Obviously, they have to win. They've played well in Candlestick, though, Mike. The Rams are in trouble, I believe. Uh, Jim Everett's uh, not having one of his greater years. And, um, you know, it really surprised me because after last year, you thought he'd come back, he and Flipper Anderson, and just, you know, uh, set the world on fire through the air. Um, he's in trouble. And if they don't get it on track this week, it's going to be a long season for the Rams. Mm, one in three, but the 49ers aren't exactly setting it on fire either. But uh, we'll see. That's a big game, a crossroads game. Thanks, Mike. We'll come back, wrap things up up close right after this. Up Close has been brought to you by Levi's Jeans for Men.